today's episode, you're going to see us completely finish a handmade custom piece of jewelry. In the past, we took and salvaged the client's gold, alloying it to the carrot of choice. Then you saw us run it through the rolling mill into a sheet of metal, but it didn't stop there. We ended up cutting, or as a goldsmith would say, sawing the desired shape piece of metal out of it, along with the bale out of the remnants as well. We then took the remnants and we created another molten piece of metal, which rolled out the bezel. Today's episode is going to take you to how the bezel is shaped and formed around the gemstone. In this case, a free form opal, perfect to show you the difficulty of what it takes to do so. So tools are involved, metal is involved and a lot of fun for me. So let's get started. We talked and I mentioned about how we took a sheet of gold and created desired shape. Yes, here is our base plate. And then from the same thickness and same piece of metal, I was able to form the bale, which goes so well because the colors match that way. Then the scrap remnants of after, left over after sawing out the desired shape center uh, model uh, base for the bezel. We took, remelted it, and then ran it through the rolling mill, creating the height needed and length needed to wrap around our free form gemstone. In this case, it is an opal that is of a free form shape. So that is a perfect one and use of <laughs> a difficult demonstration, but one that'll get the point across of how to wrap corners and how to create a custom bezel. This other piece you see to the side will be used as an accent stone on the opposing side of the major stone. So the tools involved will be simple. The primary one are what are referred to as round nose pliers. They do everything from create jump rings to what will be wrapping a bezel and shaping it around the corner of a cabochon. Next are mostly something to measure with. We have, of course, the protractor and a millimeter gauge. That will keep us centered and balanced for the look that we are trying to achieve. I do have to say this, this is what would be considered a project for the advanced goldsmith when it comes to forming a bezel to fit perfectly around something as um, fragile as an opal, let's be honest. But that's okay, I have a few years under my belt. Now, what we have is the bezel we created, and I didn't totally finish out the inner inside of it, no need to, because that won't be seen. But it is polished so that it does give a nice light reflection to the opal when completed. I have to decide primarily where I want the bezel to end, so to speak. In other words, where do I want to put the solder? Now, I've decided that the sharpest corner in the opal down over in this corner is where I want the two ends to meet. So I need to now know where I want to make my first bend. And I think what would be the easiest and have the most control is to create the sharpest bend first. So I just want to make sure I go pretty much uh, to part of the bezel that gives me plenty of room on both sides to meet at the juncture I want to finish at. And let's go ahead and put a real sharp, as you can see that angle, bend to the bezel as a beginning point. And as you can see, we have a little more shaping and bending in the corner and we will continue to do so and follow the turns and make the adjustments as needed. And when complete, it will be soldered in the corner I referred to. What you see now is the completed bezel that we have wrapped 
around the opal and soldered the junctions in the corner. Of course, not noticeable now. Now, what we are going to do next is we are going to solder that to the plate of metal. We also, though, have constructed a custom-made four-prong head out of the extra material, and that will house or set that piece of opal in it. We also then are going to solder the bale to the top and do it so that there's not a connecting ring. So we're using minimal additional findings. We have paused in the middle of the project to give you an update. I have gone ahead and as you can see, the first thing you do is you go ahead and tack, what we call tack or solder in a small point, the bezel onto the frame. That way we can adjust it as needed very easily to make sure we get it straight. What we will do now, since we have it where we want it, we will go ahead and continue what's called sweat soldering. And that is the art of being able to draw that solder all around the bottom of that bezel, creating the look of one piece and taking up any gaps between the two. Now, on the other part of the project is assembling, attaching that other opal to this side. And I thought it would be kind of whimsical and fun if we made the piece move. So I actually hand created a head out of the uh, rose gold alloy scrap we had. And I actually ran a platinum rivet through it. Platinum using that allows me to be able to um, what's uh, called rivet it or hammer hand, use my hammer hand piece to flatten down the metal against the other metal without having to use solder. That will allow a safe and secure attachment of the piece and yet still allow the piece to spin. Uh, movement in jewelry is desirable and adds value because it adds time and effort to do such a thing. And of course, using a platinum rivet it, it, uh, assures you that that movable piece won't need to be replaced along the way. So I'm going to continue to complete the soldering. I'm going to set the stone and we're going to bring you back a amazing finished piece of jewelry. And in doing so, we're also going to what's called antiquing. Darken the background behind this amazing crystal opal because it is so translucent to transparent that darkening it will bring out the actual real colors in the opal and give it a great contrast against the rose gold. I thought this was a good stopping point to show you where we have gotten on the project because what we have done now is we have sweat soldered the bezel all the way around. As you can see, there is no more gap or seam between the metals and that's what you want to have it look like when complete is a seamless job. We also have attached our little movable head over here that will spin. Now, what we have left to do is solder the bale on it and we don't do that yet because it kind of gets in the way of uh, the torch in, uh, for other projects. And also because what we want to do is a decorative border. This will create a framework for the gemstones. So we are, uh, it's going to be a work in progress because what we can do is try a couple different wheels for the type of finish it creates and then go from there. We have the uh, license to be able to uh, kind of have a little uh, flow with our own creative input on this and that's what uh, we're going to do. Now we'll experiment a little by framing it out and cutting out that border but again we may change up the interior finish. 
I thought about a crosshatch Florentine, but that makes it a little bit too old. That's not what kind of this, this piece is. Uh, I think I'm gonna go with a diamond rock wheel finish, but you're gonna get to see that in the next phase of the project. Now look at the outcome of truly what it, a master goldsmith can achieve because in the creation and um, what I really did was follow the blueprint of what the client, the designer wanted. And in doing so, and trying to please the client's design, which is very difficult as a designer myself, not to input my own thoughts into it, but to really follow and achieve what the client was wanting. I took the item and I created and riveted a little spot on the back. You can actually hand turn that and spin it from back, but to show you, here is the piece and it's very easy and rotates. Has a star would sparkle and turn. I also, uh, because it was one of my rare handmade items that I have created, which don't happen very often, went ahead and the client wanted my official signature, which is my uh, initials with the day, year I made the piece in between. You can see that at the bottom here, S18S. And then the special meaning of a date here at the top is what he wanted. And as I told him, that is what, and of course he's given it to his loved one, as an anniversary gift, but that is what personalizes it and makes it hers and special. Not my logo, because that could be on other things, but the actual something that no one else making it, uh, no one else would have anything like that. That date and meaning really is in older pieces what we look for in estate and antique jewelry. This is from start to finish. You saw us recover using old scrap gold to make the alloy. We used and recovered the chip even from the opal, combining it into the design. Then we rolled it out uh, the alloy out by hand in the you know specialized machine that is run by hand. Then we took that, we sawed it by hand, we shaped it by hand, we made the bezel from the leftover scrap pieces and the bail from the piece as well. We this is where you use all the parts that you're given, and that's what the client gave me. He gave me the metal he had and he gave me the chipped opal, and he said, create me this masterpiece. And it is extremely special for me to get the right to do it, and then the meaning behind the piece as well. I love the entire concept, and this will go on in the person's family, generation to generation, as it now has become a piece that will be inherited and a piece that will be um, a family heirloom, a family jewel for generations to come. And with the date, that adds all the, and ties all the meaning of it together, generation to generation. So I have enjoyed making this, and I think the client is pleased. You've gotten to see how something is handcrafted and that is really what i'm stressing in this episode is for something to actually have that very rare and special significant title you have to go through the steps that you just witnessed so hope you enjoyed the episode i have enjoyed creating this for you and for the client and i look forward to seeing you the next time